So Chansley has been interviewed by a number of different publications, especially in like Arizona, like uh, um, the Arizona Republic newspapers interviewed him, as well as um, the Arizona New Times. Um, he said that his beliefs were cemented by internet research and by the book, Behold a Pale Horse, which I've heard of that book before, but never, I've never to. read it um, up until a couple of days ago. But this book is the QAnon Bible. All right. their beliefs come from Behold a Pale Horse. Uh, okay. the, the book was written by an Arizona author named William Cooper, Bill Cooper, and it references groups like the Illuminati, the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderberg Group, and all the groups you know that are there trying to control and dominate the world. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's like a compendium of every conspiracy out there. Mm -hmm. It was published in 1991. And so Chansley here, the guy in the Viking hat with the red, white, and blue makeup on his face and uh, shirtless, he said, at a certain point, it all clicked. He said, oh, my God, I now see the reality of what's going on. And he believes that Cooper, who wrote the book, was killed by the government to silence him. It's not exactly what happened. Um, but uh, the, the Los Angeles Times did report that Cooper was a wanted militia figure who vowed he would never be taken alive. He said, um, Chansley said, when you do enough research, it all ties together and it all starts to make sense. I think he needs to do a little bit more research, but okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that's the thing. This is like a glimpse into the QAnon mindset. Yeah, of how, they, how they're, they're thinking, how they're organizing. So themselves. I kind of started going down the rabbit hole here and I uh, was looking Ooh. into the life of uh, Milton William Cooper, otherwise known as Bill Cooper, the author of Behold the Pale Horse. And he's the forefather of American conspiracy theorists. I mean, decades before QAnon, before Alex Jones, before the crisis actors and the false flags, there was Bill Cooper. Okay. Yeah, pretty fascinating. And, you know, you can find that book. I mean, you can find an online version, a PDF version. That's what I did. Um, but you can also buy it. I mean, it's, it's still a pretty you know, top-selling book on Amazon. You know, well, it made, must be. I bet it's been selling in spades recently, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, almost been 30 years since it's been published. Yeah. So. so Bill Cooper here um, was an American shortwave radio talk show host, an author, and a lecturer uh, during, from the late 80s to about 2001, um, where he did die in a violent, uh, a violent death, which we'll get to in a bit. Um, he's mostly known for his 1991 book, Behold a Pale Horse, in which he warned of global conspiracies, a lot of which involved extraterrestrial life. Um, that's that's okay. one thing that's kind of amazing about Bill Cooper. He sort of tied in, you know, governmental conspiracies with the aliens. So he's a bit like Nostradamus, isn't he? Nostradamus was always banging on about aliens too. Uh, you know, he does have predictions, a lot of which came true, but he doesn't consider himself like a Nostradamus or a prophet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Cooper was born in 1943. Uh, according to his bio, he was a Vietnam era veteran of the Navy and the Air Force, later became a photographer of some sort, and then he eventually made a name for himself as a UFOologist, um, you know, telling tales and lecturing about extraterrestrial races, secret human populations on the moon. Uh, he, <laughs> okay. he had a predilection for championing known hoaxes such as the infamous Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is probably one of my favorite conspiracies. Yeah, yeah. Um, Cooper actually coined the term sheeple for the every... Did he know? Yeah, that's his term. Like, that's a term that he used on his uh, radio show, uh, which applies to uh, everyday schlubs who refuse to see the truth in his message and join him on his crusade towards truth. Um, we're mere sheeple, he would say. Yeah which is a portmanteau of sheep and people, obviously. Cattle by choice and by content. So I did a bunch of research on this, on this guy, and you can't really find too much about his background. I mean, there, I've, I've read you know, a, few, um, a few accounts. There's, a, there's an author named Mark Jacobson who wrote a book about him. Um, but I, you know, I read a, you know, several different, uh, no, no real interviews with him. But, you know, several different accounts. And Wikipedia actually has a little bit about his background, but not too much is known about his, like, background or education. Um, he claimed to have served in the United States Navy, 
and the Air Force and Naval Intelligence until he was discharged in 1975. Doesn't say if it was like a dishonorable one or not, uh, but he did have a tour of duty in Vietnam and did uh, and was awarded two service medals. He said um, in 1972, he was part of a team that briefed the commander of the Navy's Pacific Fleet. It was then they claimed to have read a trove of secret documents. And years later, in his book, he writes that he used hypnosis to recall the documents that he came across. And they showed, according to Cooper, that the government had not only made contact with alien life, but struck a deal with them to turn some portion of earthlings into slave labor. And for that plan to work, the public would need to accept a global government. This guy was sniffing on some napalm in, in Vietnam, wasn't he? Something. Yeah. <laughs> something happened was, to him he was in sniffing Vietnam. on what? Agent Orange or something. Yeah. So after uh, he returned to the United States from Vietnam, he writes in his book, he attempted to tell what he knew to a reporter. Around that time, he was riding his motorcycle near Oakland, California, when, as he described, he collided with a black limousine. As a result, mm -hmm. doctors had to amputate his right leg above the knee. And he writes in Behold a Pale Horse that as he was recovering in the hospital, two men in suits visited him and asked if he had learned his lesson. They said, they, or Cooper told them that he would be a good little boy, but he silently vowed to himself from that day that he would release his information to the world. Who is he, Karen fucking Ringwood? <laughs> like, what the hell? Well, I think that was a defining moment, you know, in mm. his life. He finally saw the, uh, the men in black. And so he ended up uh, attending a junior college in California. I worked for several technical and vocational schools before lecturing about his conspiracy theories, theories in the mid to late 80s. And so during that time, I guess, in the 80s, there was a thriving UFO circuit, especially in mm -hmm. California. And he bought this whole new fresh viewpoint on UFOs by connecting the UFO phenom phenomenon to the secret government and a plan to create a new world order. And so okay. he expanded the speculations of earlier conspiracists by incorporating the government involvement with the extraterrestrials. And that was kind of his theme. Uh, th this is amazing. He, he said that, uh, this is part from one of his lectures. He read well that when he was in naval intelligence, that at least once a year, two nuclear submarines meet beneath the polar ice cap and they mate together at an airlock. <laughs> Representative, representatives of the Soviet Union meet with the policy committee of the Bilderberg Group, and the Russians are given the script for their next performance. Some things on the agenda include the combined efforts in the secret space program, which he said was uh, um, being that there was a, they established a military presence on the moon and on Mars, and that's where this global elite you know, conducted their affairs. Like, okay, Bill, slow down a minute. T <laughs> tell me how submarines have sex. Well, no, I think it's just they met. I don't think they were fucking. He said Kate. mate. He said mate. Right? Well, you tell I me think how submarines mate. Like, I, I want to know about when it's, under the polar ice caps. It's reverse sex. cowgirl. I, I don't know if you know that, but okay, yeah. Like, I can imagine that with the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union who had tons of fucking money to do this type of stuff yeah okay bill yeah and they would get their yeah. script from uh, the yeah. bilderberg group it's amazing though that this guy could like you know was a a paid lecturer about this and people would show up and be like yeah this makes sense i mean that that makes me wonder and i'll get to this in a bit later what he would have thought about the QAnon people he's like wow these people are actually listening to me in fact these people are not only listening to me they're wearing viking hats and reading my they book. Believe. <laughs> they yeah, believe. They believe. Yeah, I don't know if he would have thought this was an army or if he'd have been horrified. But we'll get to that. So from 1992, so after he was doing the lecture circuit, until 2001, so 92 to 2001, he uh, broadcast his own radio show called The Hour of the Time. And this, he did this at midnight via satellite hookups and shortwave radio frequencies from a studio in his house atop a hill in the, the uh, white mountain town of Eager, Arizona, which is like way out in the middle of nowhere, about 50 miles away from the New Mexico border. So he had this like his sounds... own fortified bunker. Okay, yeah, this sounds like familiar you. to where I am currently podcrafting from. So yeah. me and Bill have something in common there, our fortified bunkers. And so his show 
um, the hour and the time, very influential. It was one of the first to use the template that broadcasters like Alex Jones from InfoWars fame follow today. This whole idea of fake news, um, you know, like, uh, yeah. or not, the, the fake news thing isn't unprecedented in American life. I mean, uh, QAnon, Alex Jones, all their beliefs were influenced by Cooper. But I don't think any, I don't think it would have manifested in society as it, as it is now. You know, I don't think we would have had, had mainstream media covering QAnon um, unless it was something for, you know, without Bill Cooper, you know, being oh, the predecessor yeah. and uh, beginning these beliefs. Um, so Cooper sought to dramatize the urgency of this moment, you know, that, uh, that the truth had to come out about what's actually going on on his radio program. And uh, people say the thing with this radio program, they, they say it's one of the most arresting sign-ons that any program had in radio history. So every, so he did it, it was at the stroke of midnight, you would hear this when his show would start. Nice. It's like werewolves at London. The air raid sign. <laughs> Hey, it's better production value than Sick and Wrong. That know? is something I totally would have like smoked weed and listened to when I was seventeen. I would have been into that. Yeah, that this voice. This crazy nut job. Yeah, who's I'd be like, yeah, you got to listen to this nutter, guys. <laughs> well, you really can. You can go listen to it. It's uh, it's yeah. online. That voice is saying, "Lights out, lights out for the curfew of your body, soul, and mind." <laughs> so, Alex Jones, who grew up in Texas, he listened to Bill Cooper on the radio. Definitely <laughs> influenced by him. Um, a lot of people know about the book, but a lot of people don't actually know about the radio show. But Bill Cooper had a great delivery. His voice was good. Um, sometimes he was a big drinker, so sometimes he'd have a few drinks and just go off. You know, I yeah. listened, I was listening to a few and I got some clips I'm going to play a little bit later, but I can understand how he'd be influential. I can understand how he'd build an audience. Um, when Alex Jones first got his show, he would have uh, William Cooper on it every so often, but Cooper is a total paranoiac. He is a paranoid man. Um, and he's against anybody that has a radio show. It doesn't make a difference if it's a good show or a bad show. He's cantankerous by nature and pick fights with every other conspiracy and UFO expert and broadcaster out there on the same subject. He had no alliances. Even if the, I was going to say, even if the person like had the same kind of ideals as him, and hated was like, them. I agree with you, Bill. he just hated them. Hated he everybody. Everyone. He was I, a I cantankerous, he was yeah. a cantankerous <laughs> crazy loon. And yeah. uh, yeah. And he, I um, bet he was fun. I bet he was fun to fucking have an argument with. It sounds like it. If you landed on his bad side though, and earned his wrath, you were excoriated for like the entire show on air. And he yeah. hated Alex Jones. I mean, he went on well, his show a couple of times, but he did not like Alex Jones. I mean, Alex I Jones like is a frequent Bill target. More more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jones on his show traded in conspiracies. That's kind of what uh, Jones does. That's his whole thing. But yes. Cooper felt that he made up his theories Unlike Cooper's well-researched tirades, like Cooper felt, <laughs> yeah. you know, he was in the army. He actually, you know, did research on these topics, experienced these things. Whereas Alex Jones just wants to make a buck, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Cooper is particularly troubled by Jones's New Year's Eve broadcast in 1999, in which the host chronicled an apocalypse triggered by the flipping of the calendar to the year 2000. Remember that? Yeah, the whole like computer. Well, they just thought the, the world TK. was going to go crazy with the Y2K yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, Jones was completely out of his mind and panicked millions of people, Cooper said in a broadcast. Um, in 2001, Cooper said he'd heard that Jones had denounced him as, a foul, as being foul-mouthed and an incoherent old man. And Cooper oh. went on the attack saying Jones was a complete fraud. He said he hoped his audience would tell Jones what he said. He goes, though I suspect he's probably listening because he does... Alex Jones, if you're listening right now, you're a bold-faced, stinking, rotten, little coward liar. Yeah, go for it, Bill. You fucking tell me, go for it. Harsh. Another yeah. fan of uh, Cooper's radio show, uh, you might have heard of this name, Timothy McVeigh. 
Oh my God! Yes, Timmy. Yeah, What's, according to the FBI, of course Timmy will have loved him. McVeigh owned a videotape about the botched federal raid of the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas, uh, called Waco: The Big Lie that Cooper had promoted. An agent noted that McVeigh's copy um, had an Arizona address on it, indicating that McVeigh actually ordered it directly from Cooper. Oh wow! What a relic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as everybody knows, Timothy McVeigh received the death penalty for the April 1995 bomb, bombing of 1995 bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City. You know, you know, 168 people died of that. I watched his uh, execution. It was broadcast live across the internet, and I was like I do 17 that years too. old. I, it was early in the morning here. It was like I think like seven between seven and nine in the morning. Were you wanking or not wanking? All the way throughout, man. Figured. It's probably the wettest I've ever been. <laughs> um, as part of the investigation into the Oklahoma bombing, an FBI agent visited Cooper in September 1996. And Cooper told the agent that he couldn't be sure if he ever talked to McVeigh because he received so many phone calls. Uh, though he did tell the agent a tale of two mysterious men, one who sort of looked like McVeigh but a little bit taller, who visited him a few months before the bombing. And they told him to watch out for something big that was going to happen in Oklahoma City. It was Timothy. <laughs> so Bill wow. Cooper, and this is kind of why he's well known, is his prescience and his predictions were legion. I mean, he predicted so many things, and he writes a you know he writes about it in uh, in 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 the book "Behold a Pale Horse." But this guy was a veritable tinfoil hat wearing Nostradamus. He really okay. was. He didn't consider himself one, but he was. Um, so prior to the radio show, uh, he had like. A whole roundup of forecasts he wrote in 1990. Uh, he had a newsletter for this this organization he created called the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence. He said it was the largest private intelligence gathering agency in the world. And so he uh, printed this. I, I looked for it. I couldn't find it. But it was on a dot matrix printer. And uh, it, it, it had a, an article on it called Every Prediction Has Come True. And he listed 16 of his most recent prognostications that had come to pass or will soon to be fulfilled. Uh, some of these were the CIA and the military are bringing drugs into the U.S. to finance, finance their black projects. Uh, he predicted that the rape of the savings and loans by the CIA is only the tip of the iceberg. 600 banks will go under the next few years. Um, he said that the current monetary structure will be replaced by a cashless system. Uh, that That's will an old the government though, to monitor yeah. every action by computer. Yeah. I mean, look at Bitcoin, you know? Yeah. He said, if you attempt to stay out of this system, you'll not be allowed to buy, sell, work, get medical care, or anything else we all take for granted. Mm -hmm. So then uh, this all kind of culminated in, the, in his watershed book, Behold a Pale Horse, that was published in 1991 um, out of like a small New Age-oriented uh, publisher in uh, Sedona, Arizona. With an initial press run of just 3,500 books, now by, okay. the end, by the end of 2017, when this article I was reading, uh, had over 300,000 copies sold. And it's still oh, wow. a really popular book on Amazon today. Uh, though I've read that they removed the chapter in recent uh, pressings, they removed the chapter on the Jews. So What a shame for you. You're going to have to go get yeah. an original version. Um, so... Cooper would often tell his radio audience that Behold the Pale Horse is the biggest selling underground book of all time. <laughs> uh, but one thing, you, you know, one thing that's true, it's still one of the most shoplifted books in Barnes & Noble history. Is it? Yeah, a lot of that's people That's a pretty, you know, if, I, if I'd have ever written a book and that was like my thing, I would be so proud of that. Your claim to fame? Yeah, it'd be My great. book gets ripped like, off by everybody. You take that book. Yeah, you know, it'd be great. I remember, uh, I don't know, it was a weird experience, but I remember like, I think I was on like Pirate Bay and for some reason, I was just like, oh, I'll do a search for my book. And yeah, a bunch of people just uploaded it. It's fucking yeah. $5 for the EPUB. Five yeah. bucks, that was it. And yet you're fucking, you know, torrenting it? Whatever. It takes one to know one. I could, <laughs> I'd be yeah. a bit hypocritical yeah. if I was going off on torrenting. Um, but anyway, um, the other audience, and this is another interesting point about the book, uh, since its release, Behold a Pale Horse has been among the most popular prison books. Like popular books in prison. All the prisoners read it. Which is, which is kind of weird. I was thinking that's weird. Like, yeah, I, you know, I thought, so, I thought so at first. That 
Well, there's a few different books that are really popular in prison. But I thought that was weird, too. I was like, why is this book so popular? But uh, Mark Jacobson, who's I mentioned before, he's the author of a book called Pale Horse Rider, William Cooper, The Rise of Conspiracy and the Fall of Trust in America. I kind of want to check this book out, actually. I ordered it on Amazon. But he wrote like kind of a profile on uh, Bill Cooper. Uh, he felt that the book, Behold the Pale Horse, resonated so much with prisoners because Cooper felt in prison even when he wasn't in jail which is why he got so popular among prisoners. He had a real sense of being in prison, this idea that people are watching you and trying to keep you from getting to be a free person. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people would think this is paranoia, especially in the clinical sense, but it was a global paranoia, and a lot of people feel it, especially black people in America. So this yeah. book particularly resonated with a lot of black people, and a lot of rappers were heavily influenced by it. In particular, oh, wow. Old Dirty Bastard. Oh yeah. my god, I love the ODB. And he was reading this book when he was in prison. And he he read it many times. He was very influenced by it. And Mark Jacobson actually interviewed Old Dirty Bastard from Wu Tang Clan. And uh the old he, he says the old dirty bastard connection is a thing I find really fascinating. Because that book, Behold the Pale Horse, you know, came out in the middle in the mid nineteen nineties, but it's still such an influential book in the prison system. And so Old Dirty Bastard said when he, during the interview, he said, everybody gets fucked. William Cooper tells you who's fucking you. And when you're someone like me, that's some valuable information. Oh, rest <laughs> in peace, ODB. I miss you. But he's, ODB is not the only rapper who's uh, mentioned this book. Um, so there are other members of the Wu-Tang Clan, Big Daddy Kane, Busta Rhymes, Tupac Shakur, Talib Kweli, Nas, Rakim, um, Gangstar, Goody Mob. Uh, just wow. a whole number, Public Enemy, uh, yeah. Lord Allah, Lost Children of Babylon. Like all these people, you know, would tell their listeners to prepare to meet your fate like William Cooper when the stormtroopers breach your gate. Oh my God. One of Cooper's biggest acolytes was the uh, late prodigy from uh, New York City hip hop group uh, Mob Deep. Mm -hmm. um, Mark Jacobson asked Prodigy if, if it was true that he had read the 500 page book Behold the Pale Horse four times. And uh, the rapper said, no, that's a misquote. I read it six times. I need to get that shit right and exact before I went out there. Um, he says, William Cooper wrote what everybody knew. And so for many in the black community, it was common knowledge that the CIA was bringing dope into the ghetto to further enslave the people. What was a big surprise, uh, the prodigy, was that AIDS had been whipped up in a test tube in Fort Detrick as a plan to wipe out Africa. I don't know if you oh, knew that. It? Did you know oh, that? Oh, is this it? Is this the AIDS, uh, the AIDS <laughs> theory? Well, no, he had theory about he had theories about HIV. Um, oh, okay. I bet. Well, I bet he's got a fucking theory about everything. Oh, he's got a theory. This book yeah. is the Bible of conspiracy theories. Mm. He's got a theory. Everything can be explained by the Juminati. Um, <laughs> so it was Prodigy who brought the uh, Cooper's message to rap to the larger hip hop audience in a 1995 video for the remix of LL Cool J's I Shot Ya. There is a verse in it that he says, the Illuminati wants my mind, soul, and my body. Secret society is trying to keep their eye on me. And so a lot of listeners, um, you know, attest this is the first time they'd ever heard the term Illuminati. Yes. And uh, and Prodigy said the first place he ever saw the word Illuminati was in Behold the Pale Horse. He had never heard of it before that. Oh, okay. Jay-Z picked up the phrase on his 1996 album, Reasonable Doubt. So by that point, it had become completely mainstream in the hip-hop community. So Behold the Pale Horse, I mean, it's, a, it's a dense read. And it's like 500 pages. It's meandering it's got it almost sounds like the ramblings of a madman and like i believe i didn't read it from start to finish i just kind of flipped through the pdf that i found um and a lot of it's kind of hard to follow but it's a oh, I bet. compendium of conspiracy theories and some of them include the allegation that jfk was murdered by his driver discovery of a plan to blow up jupiter there is a treaty between eisenhower and space aliens um, yeah, it's like, but some of his best known predictions appear in Behold a Pale Horse. So here, here's a, a summary. AIDS. Uh, he, Cooper proposed that AIDS was a result of conspiracy to decrease the population of blacks, Hispanics, and homosexuals. And so it was like creating a test tube at, at Fort Detrick. Um, UFOs, aliens, and the Illuminati. So 
he claimed that he saw those secret documents I mentioned dealing with extraterrestrials. And uh, he said that in the, these documents that were plagiarized verbatim from their research, um, he said that uh, Cooper linked the Illuminati with his beliefs that extraterrestrials were secretly involved with the United States government. Uh, he accused Dwight Eisenhower of negotiating his treaty with aliens in 1954 and then establishing an inner circle of Illuminati to manage relations with them and keep their presence a secret from the general public. It's the men in black. Um, he feels that aliens manipulated and ruled the human race through secret societies, religions, magic, witchcraft, and the occult. And that Wait, even the Illuminati was being manipulated by them. What's his problem with the occult and like black magic? That's all fun. Why is he? What's his problem with that? Get well, off, I think the get aliens off, yeah. created pale it horse bill. to control people. Uh huh. Um, a lot of his theories have been debunked. You know, a lot well, of obviously. Uh, yeah, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, Don Ecker of UFO magazines, some people might know of him. He ran a series of exposés on Cooper in 1990. So I met mean, yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, well, debunked it. Uh, Cooper described the Illuminati as a secret international organization controlled by the Bilderberg Group that conspired with the Knights of Columbus, Masons, Skull and Bones, other organizations. Its ultimate goal was the establishment of a new world order. So the Illuminati conspirators not only invented alien threats for their own gain, but they conspired with the extraterrestrials to take over the world. And uh, he claimed that the anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, was actually an Illuminati work all along. And he instructed his readers to substitute uh, Zion for Zion, Illuminati for Jews, and cattle for Goyim. Oh, <laughs> Bill! Like, come on, Bill! Well, I think Bill had his theories. I mean, he believes Bill does things. have his theories. But I think, like, Bill needs to take a day off and just, like, you know, hang out by the pool. It's hot in Arizona. Just, you know, spend a day hanging out by the pool and just being normal. It's you amazing that barbecue. Bill... It's amazing that Bill was married with kids. Could you imagine being this guy's kid? Oh, my God. Can you imagine how hellish your childhood would have been? You'd be like, Dad, there is no such thing as lizard people. Drop it. I just, I just pictured, like, he probably had a full-on bunker that was, like, ready for the nuclear war. You know, yeah. he probably had a fallout shelter. And he just, like... Oh, yeah, you can't disturb Dad while he's in the bunker. You're probably the walls were covered in tinfoil. Like, I just imagine this guy must be crazy. So here's a caller from uh, his show, the... Uh, on um, his show from our time, uh, where they're talking about the Juminati. Okay. I, I believe that they that they uh, um, overthrew his conviction because of that. He so, a little context here. Um, this guy called in and was talking about I forget the guy's name, something Jewish name, Jewish surname. Uh, he supplied a lot of the the bombs and the materials to build the bombs to Timothy McVeigh. And okay. so when he yeah. was uh, during the trial, they ended up dismissing the charges against this guy because I guess he didn't have um, adequate uh, representation. And mm -hmm. so this this caller is claiming that there's got to be more of a conspiracy behind this with this Jewish man who supplied all these weapons to McVeigh. Yeah. Um, that's one of my favorite things about his show, Bill Cooper's show, is the callers. The callers are amazing. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm only going to play this one. Villain. Uh, yeah. A boner villain and just like all these insane Karens. It's it's hilarious. But a lot of guys like this guy. He, he didn't have a proper defense and uh, sealed the records and he disappeared. Okay, I saw it on your internet site where he was convicted, but apparently he, he never went to prison at all, I guess. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, they just let him go. It's probably the Israeli Mossad. I think. I think. He's, I, think I think he's with. Well, I think this was a combination of the of the CIA, the FBI, the Israeli Mossad, uh, the BATF, and uh, several other uh, uh, the of German intelligence for sure. Because uh, Andreas Strassmeyer was a part of this. He's another Jewish uh, man who was a member of the German intelligence uh, structure. Um, who who uh, was instrumental in planning the whole thing? Right. Well, our government may as well be the Mossad, and you know, Capitol Hill is Israeli yeah. occupied territory. And, what, what, uh, what you have <laughs> what you have to understand is this is not leading toward an Israel of the world. It's leading toward a a Marxist socialist utopian 
or they believe it's utopian. It's going to be like the old Soviet Union, world government. World um, government. Whenever, globalist. Yes, and whenever the media covers something up real well like this, the way they let Spiegelman go like that, uh, you, you know it's the Jews who are behind it. No, Got to be the Jews. <laughs> Jews behind it, and, and I've never said that, and, and neither should you. Uh, George Bush is certainly not a Jew, but he's a part of it. Right, he works for them. Yeah, they put him in office. No, and it's CBS. not that he works for them. You don't understand the structure of Get the Bill organization that is actually guy. bringing apart yes. world government. The reason that they're able to recruit so many Jewish people to be a part of this is the Jews have never allowed themselves to assimilate as citizens, really, of any country. They're always Jewish. They always separate themselves. They always look forward to next year in Jerusalem. They believe themselves to be a part of a world, and they want to bring about a world government. So they're, they're sympathetic to this whole okay, one-world government ideal. But the people at the heart and soul of all of this, and there are a lot of Jewish people involved, are what's called the Illuminati. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> Well, I mean, the Jew. Bill stands by his convictions. I mean, he definitely believes it. He believes I'm, what he says. I'm getting some major Dale Gribble vibes from all of this. <laughs> but I kind so, of think that Dale Gribble is, like, easier to talk to. <laughs> yeah. Well, definitely easily influenced. So uh, the Kennedy assassination. In, uh, in the book, Cooper asserts that President JFK was assassinated because he was about to reveal that extraterrestrials were in the process of taking over the Earth. No, he wasn't. <laughs> well, that's no, what he's about this, to do. This is going to make me angry. <laughs> no, he wasn't. According to a top secret video of the assassination that Cooper claimed to have discovered, the driver of his presidential limousine, William Greer, used a gas pressure device developed by aliens from the Trilateral Commission to shoot the president from the driver's seat. No, he didn't, Bill. I don't know how it somehow got in the back of his head, but it's, you know, kind of like shot and then went around like went a around, curved. It got, you know, gas powered special. I don't know how no, none of the witnesses there, nor Jackie O saw this happen. Um, <laughs> the, oh, Zupru no. the Zapruder film shows Greer twice turning to look into the backseat of the car. Cooper theorized that Greer first turned to assess Kennedy's status after the external attack and then to fire the fatal shot. Conspiracy theories implicating Greer reportedly snowballed after the publication of Behold a Pale Horse. Oh, that poor guy. Like, nothing <laughs> nothing angers me more than people who don't believe that Lee Harvey didn't kill JFK. The, me and Bill would have argued over this. We'd have had a stand-up fight in a pub over this. I think he would have schooled you just home. like he did that caller. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, he predicted the high school shootings at Columbine. So eight years before the Trenchcoat Mafia murders at Columbine, uh, Cooper wrote... The sharp increase of prescriptions of psychoactive drugs like Prozac and Ritalin to younger and younger children will inevitably lead to a rash of horrific school shootings. These in incidents, he said, will be used by the elements of the federal government as an excuse to infringe upon the, ci the citizen citizenry's Second Amendment rights. Yeah, but that's not what Columbine was about. And only one, only Eric Harris had very briefly been on prescription drugs. For depression. Adam Lanza, and That's why though. he couldn't get into the military. From Sandy that, Hook. He was on uh, psychoactive drugs. Yeah, but I mean, that's not predicting Columbine because Columbine was a failed bombing. It wasn't, it was never going to be a school shooting. It was going to be but a it bombing. It turned out to be a school shooting. It did, but they weren't doing that. And they that had because, guns. I think they were, yeah. they were, and they had multiple weapons. I mean, they were ready they to, did have to weapons, shoot and, it was a failed and, and, yeah. bombing. But I the think they were planning on shooting off. as well. So, I mean, I think. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you could say this is just, he was saying that there's going to be high school shootings. This was eight years before, you know, the major one in there's Columbine. There's always been high school shootings in America. Me and Bill would have argued over this. Um, for many, including those who would later claim that the endless series of school shootings were part of a plot by gun control advocates to take away America's weapons. Right. Um, <laughs> and they say Cooper's words took on an air of prophecy. I'm, I'm uh, specifically addressing... Alex Jones. You know, Alex mm -hmm. Jones was claiming that, uh, you know, all this conspiracy stuff, that there are crisis actors at Sandy Hook. You know, oh. none, of the, none of that was real. It was all staged to take away our guns. But it's interesting, Mark Jacobson's book says that even if Cooper said many harsh things, he loved his kids. 
even the ones he abandoned, and he revered the family. He might have supported Jones on the First Amendment grounds, but he would have denounced the thoughtlessness of uh, Alex Jones's claims that this was all a hoax. Uh, Cooper yeah. was a conspiracy guy, but he was like a, more of a desperate man in search of some kind of version of the truth, but he wasn't like a sick fuck like Alex Jones. He's not out there peddling these baseless conspiracy theories just to make a buck. Oh, yeah, Sandy Hook, that whole conspiracy theory. That whole theory. thing. That's, that he was awful. He was just doing it to uh, for the, you know, the negative publicity, you know? Oh, completely. But, you know, hey, it's worked for him, hasn't it? Put his name on the map. Yeah. But mm. it's also uh, put his name on many lawsuits, too. So we'll see what happens to that. Good. I mean, <laughs> yeah. He's being sued for like $4 billion or something. Uh, Bill Cooper never claimed to be a prophet. He said, I'm no prophet. I'm no Nostradamus. I have no crystal ball. I'm just an ordinary guy. And he said, there's nothing supernatural about his predictions. Anyone could do it. It's just meth- methodology summed up in what he called his standard admonition. He says, and this is what he would say to every listener of his show, Hour of the Time, you must not believe anything you hear on this show. Nor was the listener to believe anything you heard from any other show, Larry King Live, Dan Rather, George Bush, Bill Clinton, or anyone in the entire world. Whether you hear it on the radio or television or from the lips of someone standing right in front of you, listen to everyone, read everything, believe nothing question everything it's very anarchist approach to life bill until you can prove to yourself whether it's true or false or what lies between the many shades of gray if you don't do this if you can't do this or too too plain lazy to do it then you're going to march into the new world order as a docile slave (laughs) and then he would uh, he would when he would go off on this rant he would end it with the sound of a sheep like (laughs) because you're a sheeple um, his most famous prediction, though, came out in June 28, 2001, months before 9-11. It was a little past his 58th birthday, and he was drinking heavily, doing his program from his fortified bunker um, in Arizona. So uh, check this out. This is kind of what he's most known for. How about that? They're doing the same thing today with Osama bin Laden, and that's where I've been getting at. Can you believe what you have been seeing on CNN today, ladies and gentlemen? Can't Can you believe, believe it? <laughs> Supposedly, a CNN reporter found Osama bin Laden, took a television camera crew with him, went into Osama bin Laden's hideout, interviewed him and his top have you ever seen that footage? It's like a reporter's in the cave, yeah, like interviewing in him. Cave. I remember yeah. even seeing that. Like, how did this happen? Aren't, aren't we searching for this guy? It at the time, yeah. What did they like blindfold the guy, put him on the back of a camel, and take him up in the mountains or something? I think that's what it did. But Osama bin Laden was all about the publicity. Loved oh it. yeah, he was. He loved the live. Didn't he have like a one one room in like one cave room or something that was just filled with porn? That dude loved he his might, porn. Is that, is that what you would have had? Of course. In your hideout. No, but I mean, when... Uh, the porn room. <laughs> yeah. When, I thought when they shot him, they found like just... Like the room just had like a ton of porn magazines. Like jugs. I think it, I think you're right. That does bring... Jugs like, magazine? <laughs> yeah. Flashbacks. Leadership. His top lieutenants and colonels and generals in their hideout. This is a CNN reporter with a camera crew. And he came out and told everybody within... Three weeks, Osama bin Laden is going to attack the United States and Israel. Now, don't you think that's kind of strange, folks? I think it's a little strange, Bill. Um, <laughs> he goes on to, uh, goes on a little bit further. And you know what his budget is? <laughs> Zip, zilch, nothing. Now, that tells us two things. Either everyone in the intelligence community and all of the intelligence agencies of the United States government are blithering idiots and incompetent fools, including the entire apparatus of the FBI and all of their personnel. Well, none of them can find him. Or they're yeah. lying to us. They're not oh, looking for him at all. Dun, 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 dun. I don't know, know if they ever is. were. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't think they ever were. But what are they going to do, Bill? Why don't you tell us? And whatever is going to happen that they're going to blame on Osama bin Laden, don't you even believe it. (laughs) He's a patsy. Don't even believe it. Not even for a second. 
Yeah, Bill Bill knows what's going on. He knows what's happening. Bill has his finger on the pulse. Yeah. Another social illusion, social engineering project to change the minds and the attitudes and the beliefs of the people of the world, and especially the United States, to bring about one world socialist totalitarian government. That's the plan. That's why 9-11 happened. The CIA, the NSA, the FBI, the Defense Intelligence Agency could not find Osama bin Laden in their wildest dreams. But CNN had no problem doing it. CNN. <laughs> this is, this is kind of like the culmination point. This is what it's all leading up to. And there will be a war in this country, a civil war yep. to restore, not a revolution, but a civil war to restore constitutional Republican government. So it happened on January 6th. Now, at the same time that that's going on, communist and Marxist underground forces will begin <laughs> or try to begin a revolution. So QAnon people right now are losing their order minds. To institute they a are. Marxist it's the prophecy. But QAnon is adding pedophilia into it. It's like not only yeah. they, like not only is there this like world power, this new world order, but it's a new world order of pedophiles. Like they need to take it one step further, oh, you know. Yeah. And so anyway, this is the prophetic. Um, point of this broadcast that, that he's known that he's known for that the infamous part of it yeah, what about it you know that's a, that's a good time for it to happen yeah well I, I certainly hope not but uh, if, I hope it, I hope not too but I'm telling you right now as I told you before I, I'm telling you that something's going to happen if it doesn't happen in the next two or three weeks something eventually something terrible is going to happen in this country uh, and it's going to be a terrorist attack and we're going to know who did it. And, and, it's, and we're going to watch CNN and whatever, and they're going to go, oh, is this? And, and, it, and it's going to be big enough that martial law could be declared and, and it could start the whole thing. So there you go. And so what happened? This was in June. And so what happened just a, a few months later, two and a half months later, September 11th, 2001, Twin Towers. A terrorist up. attack. Terrorist attack. Killed 2,996 people, including 343 NY fire department personnel um and that's the day his prophecy was realized cooper stayed on air for 10 hours and in the initial hours after the attack he theorized that the towers of the world Tra trade center came down by controlled demolition oh bill come oh, yeah. on bill and he made another prediction he said that uh i can assure you 72 hours from now we will be at war we'll be bombing two or three countries, because that's how it works. When governments are attacked, they lash out. Thousands of people who had nothing whatsoever to do with this, or what happened at the World Trade Center, are going to die. And nothing will be the same after today. And he was saying within weeks, Congress passed uh, draconian legislation that restricted the rights of American citizens. So, you know, you're going to have uh, surveillance cameras on every street corner. Your phones are going to be tapped. Everyone's going to been lose. Way more impressed if he just predicted, like, you're not allowed to take more than 100 mils of any liquid on the plane now. <laughs> you got to take your shoes off. Impressed. You got to take your shoes off. You can't be taking nail clippers on your carry-on. <laughs> you, you guys are the worst in England. You got to have that little plastic bag. It's like a little size yeah. of a sandwich bag. You know, the, I always say that that's actually an affront to women because they, they consider all makeup to be liquid. Yeah, what about so tampons? You should, no, you know, there's some tampons in there. Yeah, but. no, tampons aren't liquid. They're, they're you could put a bomb in a tampon. Um, You probably could. Yeah, you can put a bomb in anything if you want. Well, I've got a bomb-ass bomb pussy and they let me on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> um, But yeah, so he told the audience that the nation itself, America is going to be the true victim here. And his theories became the center of uh, future conspiracies against, you know, arguing that 9-11 terrorism attacks were an inside job by the U.S. government. We all know about right. those. He started it. Okay, he, he's Bill. the one. It all came from that. Yeah, it can't just be a horribly tragic event because America had been bombing the Middle East for like close to 20 years. And it can't just be somebody doing a retaliation. It can't be that, can it be? No, that doesn't make any no, sense. It's a no, new world order. Doesn't. You know, no. <laughs> um, so a guy like this isn't going to just die of a heart attack and be cremated, you know, yeah, and, and put in an urn retire, on his no. wife's mantle. Not, mm -hmm. not a guy like this. So as Cooper, Bill Cooper moved away from the UFOlogy community, 
and he became more towards like anti-government militia. This is like late 1990s. He was convinced that he was being personally targeted by President Bill Clinton and the IRS. And so in uh, June 1998, he and his wife were indicted on three counts of attempted tax evasion. And the U.S. Marshal tried to serve Cooper with an order to appear in court, but Cooper chased him off his property with rifles, yeah. claiming he had no jurisdiction. I mean, this yeah, guy no, lived on no, this no, like no. remote, no. you know, cabin up there. You know, it was a bunker. He had like weapons. He claimed like he could snipe people, you know, from the top of this hill as a vantage yeah, point. Bet he could. I mean, he was like full on paranoid, insane by this point. You know, the late nineties. Uh, he posted a lengthy essay on his website describing how he was under siege by the government, and he appeared to be well. FBI said he appeared to be relishing this role that he had created, created for himself as like a true patriot mm-hmm. that's going to die a martyr. And so agents were like, you know, we don't want to have another repeat of what happened at Waco. So let's just not engage with him. They feared a violent clash. Let's just kind of let him stew in his own juices here and just see what happens. They did put him on an informal house arrest. And he feared leaving his house. He never would leave his property because he, were, he was worried that he was going to be taken into custody. So he just stayed in his house. His wife would go out. His kids yeah. would go out. But he just, like, you know, hunkered up in his, uh, in his, his shelter. He'd, he'd be great at lockdown. He's, he's, you know, he's got the training in. I think he would have. Uh, could you imagine his, his theories on COVID? Oh, my God. Yeah, I'm kind of, kind of glad that. <laughs> um, one of his friends told uh, the FBI that uh, he felt that Cooper sought to become a martyr. So if he's killed, he will end up being somebody important. He died for a cause. Uh, one of his friends here was probably this guy that said it. Glenn Jacobs is a publisher of a weekly newspaper called the Round Valley Paper, uh, which talked about a lot of political points and national events. Uh, he said Cooper favored Chavez Regal, drank heavily. And it, he became a, like a, a complete alcoholic in later years. Uh, the quote, he crawled into the bottle and pulled the bottle in after him. <laughs> and so uh, Jacobs and his wife would go visit him regularly. And typically his children would greet them at the, you know, in his driveway. And he was a family man. I mean, he had a wife, he had kids. Uh, but one day Jacobs went over there and Cooper opened up the door shirtless. And he had a large bandage on his side which he said happened due to a gardening accident. But no one else was home. His wife wasn't there. His kids weren't there. And Cooper told uh, Jacobs that he had moved his wife and children to a place where no one could harm them. A secret place. He's killed them. Well, that's what Jacobs was like. Something might have happened. And he suspected that his friend might have killed his family. So well, that's he, what you'd automatically think, isn't it? A secret well, it's, place. It's kind of weird. I mean, if you're like, you know, a regular visitor over there and one day you show up, dude's not wearing a shirt. He's got this big wound on his side yeah. and he reeks of uh, Chavez Regal. I would have been like, uh, so he called the FBI. And at, after that point, um, Cooper referred to him as Judas. The betrayer. <laughs> yeah. um, Cooper didn't kill his family. He didn't. Um, according to the FBI, his wife left him. And took their daughters and they moved to California. I do not blame so, her. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the guy's insane. That. Could you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> he's oh got guns God. probably in every room. You know, mm-hmm. he's probably making them wear bulletproof vests. You know, it's you just like, always be like, Bill, can we just have a bit of lighthearted humor? Can we watch like a rom com together tonight? Can you just like take it from like 11 down to a four tonight? Like, if not everything's a conspiracy, Bill. Like, come yeah. on. And I bet, I bet every night, I bet every night he was just going off about the New World Order. You get sick of it. I bet you the movie Groundhog Day just set him off. <laughs> you know? I, bet you, I bet you he wouldn't watch Hollywood That's propaganda That's what the sheep films. will watch. Yeah, yeah. Um, the wife uh, spoke with federal agents uh, beginning in the summer of 1999, giving them details of her husband's daily routine and financial activities. Uh, the government ended up, because of her cooperation, they dropped its case against her in mm-hmm. March of 2000. Cooper, however, was telling the radio audience that he had moved his wife and children out of the country to a secret location for their safety. And well, so, you're meanwhile, a liar now, Bill, aren't you? You're well, a liar. I think he was you're saying this to your, to your people. Well, he's living in an alternate reality at this point. Um, yeah. His relationships with his siblings were fractured. His drinking and his belligerence made him very unpleasant to deal with, especially if someone tried to challenge his beliefs. 
I mean, he would go off. Um, one relative said that the motorcycle accident that resulted in him losing his leg was not caused by CIA agents. It was just a regular accident. Yeah, that happens just hit all by a the car. time. When, yeah. <laughs> so Take that risk when you drive a bike. What drive. ended up happening uh, when it eventually caused his violent death. So in July 2001, a doctor who had grown up in Eager, Scott Hamblin, recently moved back and he wanted to show his wife and daughters a spot where as a kid he had watched the storms roll in. It's it on Rodeo Hill. And it happened to be really nearby where Cooper lived. Um, he had never met Cooper Everyone knew the reputation of the crazy man who lived up in the house on the hill. Um, but, you know, he, he didn't know him personally. And so he went over with his family to go check out, uh, you know, this, this, this point in nature, this, this hill. And uh, he noticed his car was following him the whole time down the hill and into town and into the family's driveway. Yeah. So Cooper saw him on Rodeo Hill and then he followed him all the way home to his house. Hamlin said he like got his family inside and he walked up to Cooper's truck. He was like, yo, what are you doing? And as soon as he got to the truck, Cooper jabbed his finger at his chest. And he told him to stay the fuck off the hill. He also accused Hamlin of surveilling him. And he, Hamlin said he grabbed Cooper's hand and pushed it away. And he told Cooper he had no idea who he was. And that's when Cooper took a gun, pointed at his head and said, you should find out who I am. Stay the fuck Bill. away from the hill. No, Bill's lost it. Bill's lost Billy, it. Billy, yeah. So Hamblin, this doctor, called the police. And at first the police was like, uh, do we have to deal with this? <laughs> you know, I they're bet, reluctant yeah. to take action because they're just like, all right, you know, the local fucking insane person. Um, and then uh, they were like, all right, we got to check into this. So the sheriff, sheriff's office, I mean, you can't go around threatening citizens, driving around with mm -hmm. guns, terrorizing families. Not the families. good doctors. So on, Bill. the sheriff's office issued a warrant for his arrest on uh, Cooper's arrest on suspicion of aggravated assault. And then they were trying to plan the best way to serve this warrant because Cooper is a paranoiac with an arsenal of weapons who lives up on a bunker on a hill. Um, Cooper would frequently say on his radio show, they're coming to get me, ladies and gentlemen. They're going to kill me. They're going to come up here in the middle of the night and they're going to shoot me dead right on my doorstep. He wrote that he thought the government had dossiers on all the patriots and they would likely resist the formation of a totalitarian police state under global command because that's what the globalists are trying to do. So he said the plan would be to round up all the patriots when it would cause as little stir as possible, probably on a holiday like Thanksgiving when people would be home full of food and drink and sleepy. He gave his readers a warning. My recommendation is that no patriot should ever be at home or at the home of any family member on a holiday ever again. Oh, God, I agree with Bill. I know. I was about to say, out of all the insane things he, he has to his spouse, I kind of agree with that one. I agree, too. Yeah. You know? give, give up the holidays. <laughs> but he was it. right. Around midnight, November 5th, 2001, less than two months after 9-11, the police came to his uh, front door. They came on knocking. So deputies would attempt a ruse to draw him out. So around midnight, they showed up, they drove up to the hill, they parked, and they were playing loud music, acting as if they were partying teenagers. Right. So Cooper came out to chase them away, but he never got out of his vehicle, as deputies had expected. So they thought he was going to come out and be like, get off my property, and then they were mm -hmm. going to come out and arrest him. And that's when the, uh, the arrest went south. Uh, deputies converged on Cooper as he tried to drive back to his house, a tactical van that was supposed to block the street never got into position, and Cooper drove around it, like off the road. Uh, he then parked his truck in his driveway, and his deputies gave chase on foot. He got out of his truck, nearly made it to his front door when he turned around and just opened fire. <sighs> One shot struck a deputy, Robert uh, Marinez, in the head, leaving him gravely wounded. Another deputy, Joseph Goldsmith, returned fire, shooting Cooper nine times, emptying his whole wow. gun. Uh, Cooper took fatal hits to his heart and his head. But his death at the hands of the police. As predicted by Bill. <laughs> as predicted, brought more credibility to his message. It most certainly did and you know, will do. He's a martyr. He's now a martyr. He's a yeah. martyr, and that's what he wanted to achieve. And it's undeniable, you know, that this whole narrative 
you know, and the theories that are in Behold the Pale Horse has directly influenced America's right wing patriot movements. But oh, one in particular right? has been influenced beyond everyone else, and that's the QAnon movement. I mean, QAnon has some of the most like insane batshit theories of any of these uh, conspiracy groups. I mean, they, they think theory. Democrats are doing the bidding, bidding of these globalists in order to shield their perversions, including devouring babies for their nourishing blood. You know? Yeah, they don't believe that birds are real either. They believe that <laughs> birds are drones. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they, fi- they, they feel that there's an anonymous figure inside the government who's posting cryptic clues to the corruption and the perpetrators of these child sex crimes. You know, there's this Q, you know, who lives in there. And Jake Angeli, Mr. Vikinghorn's guy, you know, has uh, appeared at all these events in his outfit having, wearing, holding a sign saying, Q sent me. You know, he's the QAnon shaman. And he believes that there's these groups, you know, that control the world. Obviously, this guy, I mean, impressionable guy, you know, a mm-hmm. paranoid, scared man, probably is never really educated, you know, probably probably is educated to a, like a high school level, maybe a couple of years of college. He reads this book, and next thing you know, it's gospel to him. You know, this is the Bible. Every, yeah. si- every single thing, doesn't even question it. Which I, you would oh. think that Cooper would want him to, but he just well, takes it as gospel, Cooper like everybody else. Cooper says, doesn't he? You, yeah. You question everything. You read everything, listen to everything, question everything, and make your own opinion. And do your own research on it. So, and I guess, yeah. I mean, Angeli, I might be selling him short saying he's probably poorly educated. Obviously, it's a... Um, that's me being biased. Well, that outfit shows that. And but that's me being biased. His tattoos show that he is poorly educated. But the, the thing is that these QAnon people do their research. They go on the internet and they just go on different QAnon forums and they do their research. Well, yeah, and it's just all ex- kept very It compounds the insanity. Thing. Yes, you know? they all wind each other up. I read in this interview uh, with Mark Jacobson, the author of The Pale Horse Rider, they asked him, do you think, what do you think Cooper would think of the current political situation in the U.S. if you're still alive? And he said, I think Cooper would be appalled He would. at what's going on I right now. He would. He's yeah. a constitutionalist. He's a believer in the U.S. Supreme Court. It's one of those things that you have to have faith in. And it's got to represent everybody, and it's not supposed to be political. If Bill Cooper is alive, at least off everything I've heard from him, I think you'd feel that what's going on right now is a logical progression of what he considered to be a secret hand of evil that was moving along to put these people who really didn't deserve to be in power in power and they would roll the ball further into fascism. And I think that, That's, I think he's referring to Trump. Yeah. You know? I, I definitely think he is. 